Welcome and thank you for joining us for a discussion about the accurate diagnosis and personalized treatment of non-small cell lung cancer for the interdisciplinary team. This is uh, education provided by the NCCN in close collaboration with the France Foundation. I'm Sundi Patel, a medical oncologist at the University of California, San Diego, where I focus on the care of patients with thoracic malignancies. And it's my honor to introduce my esteemed colleagues for this program, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Grace Lynn. I'm Grace Lynn. I'm also at UC San Diego, and I am a pathologist. Dr. David Ost. Hello, um, my name is David Ost. I'm professor of medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, and I am an interventional pulmonologist. Thank you. Dr. Matt Gubins. My name is Matt Gubins. I'm at the University of California, San Francisco, and I'm a thoracic medical oncologist. Great. And Dr. Momin Wahidi. Hi, everyone. This is Momin Wahidi. I'm an interventional pulmonologist at Duke University. Great. And Casey Bamel. Hi, I'm Casey Bamel. I'm a nurse practitioner at the University of California, San Diego. That's great. And we'll be discussing multiple uh, cases uh, today with the learning objective of developing effective strategies for multidisciplinary management of non-small cell lung cancer from the esteemed faculty uh, who you just heard from. And so for the first case, I'd like to invite Dr. Wahidi and Dr. Ost uh, to discuss the case of, of Margaret. Thanks, Sandeep. Um, uh, I'd like to present the case of Margaret. Margaret is a 59-year-old woman who presented to the emergency room with chest pain, weakness, and weight loss. She's a current smoker and has a history of 40-pack year uh, smoking. She has had some cardiac evaluation and uh, that ruled out any cardiac abnormalities. In the ED, she had a chest x-ray followed by a chest CT, which showed a mass in the left lung, particularly in the left lower lobe. Um, and there's also enlarged lymph nodes in the mediastinum and the left hilar area. And those were seen on the CAT scan. A uh, patient was discharged from the emergency room and uh, she had a follow-up appointment with her primary care physician. Her primary care physician evaluated her and had a high suspicion for lung cancer. And so the primary care physician ordered a PET scan. You can see here that the PET scan showed increased FDG uptake in several lymph nodes, including the right paratracheal lymph node or lymph node station 4R, the subcarinal lymph node, uh, lymph node station seven, and the left hilar lymph node, lymph node station 10L. After reviewing the PET scan, the PCP referred Margaret to the thoracic oncology clinic. And uh, the, the case of Margaret was discussed in our multidisciplinary uh, team discussion. And we um, looked at the PET scan first and based on the uh, FDG avid lymph nodes, it appears that Margaret may have a clinical stage 3B lung cancer because the lymph nodes on the contralateral side are involved, representing an N3 involvement, which would push her cancer to stage 3B. Our multidisciplinary team is comprised of all specialties that care for the lung cancer patient, including the medical oncologist, the radiation oncologist, the thoracic surgeon, pulmonologist, radiologist, and pathologist. And we also have participation uh, from the palliative care specialist. And uh, we uh, discuss all the aspects of this case. And then after the meeting, we relate those discussions and recommendations to our primary care physician. It's important to remember what the guidelines suggest uh, for workup for a patient like Margaret. If we look at the CHESS guidelines from 2013 for lung cancer staging, it does state that in patients with imaging finding, uh, particularly PET, suggestive of metastases, that further evaluation of the abnormality with tissue sampling is recommended. Um, you can't really rely on PET scan alone or CHESS CT alone to uh, have a final uh, stage for the patient's potential lung cancer because both the CT and the PET can give you false positives. Uh, so it's really imperative to sample these uh, potential metastatic sites as not to exclude the patient from potentially curative treatment with surgery. Uh, if there's overwhelming evidence of metastases on the CT or PET, 
then you don't have to go after each metastatic site and just uh, one site to prove the diagnosis of lung cancer and obtain en enough tissue should be adequate. Um, the multidisciplinary consensus was to sample the mediastinal lymph node to obtain an accurate staging of the patient's lung cancer. So we performed bronchoscopy with endobronchial ultrasound guided sampling of the lymph node. It's important to remember that the bronchoscopist has to stage in a systematic way, starting with the highest possible uh, stage lymph node, which in this case would be the N3 or the contralateral side. Um, here in, in, in Margaret will be the right paratracheal lymph node, followed by N2, which would be the subcarinal lymph node or the ipsilateral mediastinal lymph node uh, would be left paratracheal lymph node. And at the end, perhaps sample N1, although those can be sampled during surgery. We performed the bronchoscopy and sampled uh, the right paratracheal lymph node followed by the subcarinal lymph node. I'd like to ask uh, Grace to, follow, to, to review the finding of our sampling. So on the finial aspirate, what we saw is an area that looks like um, these epithelioid histiocytes uh, in the center of the field as shown here with these um, very uh, abundant eosinophil cytoplasm. And the background shows abundant lymphocytes indicating that this does represent lymph node sampling. And the FNA of the subcrinal lymph node, again, was adequate because it also showed abundant lymphocytes, but there was no tumor identified in either the right paratracheal or the subcrinal lymph node. Thank you, Grace. So we, we thought that these lymph nodes might be involved in the cancer, but right now we have negative sampling by EBIS um, guided sampling. So I'm wondering about the next steps and whether we should repeat the bronchoscopy or maybe perform mediastinoscopy or just send her to surgery uh, or maybe ask the radiologist to sample that mass in the left lower lobe. Let me turn it to my colleague, David, and see what he thinks about the next steps. Thank you, Moment. This is a complex case and it emphasizes the value of interdisciplinary discussion. We know that the PET scan by itself is not sufficient. We've now done an EBUS and the EBUS shows some granulomas and adequate lymphocytes, but no evidence of cancer. EBUS is sensitive for cancer with an overall sensitivity in patients like Margaret of around 90% and 92% on a per lymph node basis. The question becomes, what is the negative predictive value in this particular instance? And even though the sensitivity of EBUS is fairly good, because her pretest probability of disease is very high, we need to confirm that indeed her mediastinal lymph nodes are truly negative. So the key concept there is, even though EBUS has high sensitivity, when your pretest probability is high, we need to confirm with some other means that indeed the mediastinal lymph nodes are truly negative. So Margaret undergoes a mediastinoscopy. In this case, we're going to be paying attention to the right paratracheal and subcarinal lymph nodes, but they're going to sample all of the mediastinal lymph nodes. And what we find is that there is indeed granulomas, and most importantly, there are no tumor cells evident in the mediastinum. Remember, however, that mediastinoscopy cannot sample the hyalur lymph nodes. So at this point, we have essentially ruled out N2 disease because we've performed both the EBUS and the mediastinoscopy. We really don't know the status of the ipsilateral hyalur lymph nodes, the N1 lymph nodes, because mediastinoscopy cannot sample them, although EBUS can sample them. And when you do systematic staging, you should sample them. But in this case, they were negative by EBUS. So what have we achieved? Well, we started with clinical stage 3B disease based on the PET scan, but through both EBUS followed by 
mediastinoscopy, the current estimation of the stage is T2A, NX, but we've ruled out N2 disease and M0. This is useful for us in that we have further clarified the situation, but we need to avoid starting treatment prematurely based on just the PET scanning itself. We need complete information, requisite information, so that we can treat the patient properly. Thanks, David. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's important to remember how crucial staging is, accurate staging, to ensure the best outcome for our patients. I'll discuss briefly a study that looked at staging and how well are we doing with staging for lung cancer. Uh, this is a slightly older study, but it does make a point about the need to stage patients accurately. You can see the study looked at Medicare beneficiaries with non-small cell lung cancer and looked at whether they received a staging single modality, which was chest CT, bimodality, which is CT and PET or CT and invasive staging, and trimodality, which is CT and PET and invasive staging. And this study found that only 30% of the patients had bimodality staging and only 5% had trimodality staging. And you can see on the, on the right-hand side of the slide, the survival curves of every stage, one, two, three, and four, and that the patients who received the complete staging with the trimodality had better survival than bimodality and single modality. You can argue about the study methodology, but this brings the point that it is really important to confirm your patient's staging or stage with radiographic study as well as tissue sampling, particularly when the mediastinum could be involved. Well, I'll turn it over to David again. He followed this patient, and uh, it looks like the patient was referred to surgery. David? So at this point, having done good systematic sampling with the EBUS followed by mediastinoscopy, the patient is ready for surgery. The mass was resected, and at the time of surgery, they did a lobectomy with full lymph node dissection, and immunohistochemical staining confirmed that indeed this was adenocarcinoma of the lung. Uh, tissue samples were sent for next generation sequence. And this brings in the other elements of our multidisciplinary team. And I'll ask Grace to uh, comment on the additional tissue analysis. So in terms of the tissue that we have out of a resection specimen, it is always going to be more ideal for us to do additional studies on than on something that might be from a cytology specimen or something that might be scanty. Interpretation of those results are always going to be much easier. In addition, in terms of additional potential testing mechanisms for actionable mutations, while there are a lot of immunohistical is immunohistochemical markers for like mutation specific um, genes such as EGFR mutations or um, generally the recommendation is used to use next generation sequencing or broader modalities rather than trying to identify single gene mutations via immunohistochemistry. I think this brings up a good discussion. Um, we're used to order uh, you know, analysis for driver mutation in advanced stages of uh, non-small cell lung cancer but maybe I'll bring in my colleagues from oncology, Sandeep and Matt. Uh, this was an earlier stage lung cancer, uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Are we now uh, testing for driver mutations in these patients and is there a role for adjuvant chemotherapy after resection? And so in terms of adjuvant chemotherapy, um, absolutely that represents the standard of care for these patients for cycles of platinum-based uh, chemotherapy. This patient ended up being stage 2B. Um, it's important to know we started at stage 3B where concurrent chemo radiation and immunotherapy for a year would have been their default path without appropriate staging as was conducted here. And so this is obviously a very different course already, mainly due to accurate diagnosis. Um, and then in, in the current state, at least in the United States, um, testing for EGFR and consideration of adjuvant osimertinib after completion of four cycles of cisplatin-based um, uh, chemotherapy uh, is an option that's been shown to improve disease-free survival, though we don't know um, the benefit in terms of overall survival uh, to date. That's three years of adjuvant osimertinib at the current time. 
So I would say in the present time that um, it, it certainly is a standard of care to at least check for that EGFR activating mutation in a non-squamous early stage patient to consider them for Adewara. This patient happened to get next generation sequencing, which we often do, again, because that's become so routine and because some of these assays are available to us, especially at academic centers. And of course, it does help select patients for trials and potentially sets the stage for if the patient has metastatic progression later to have at least started the process to be able to treat them quickly and efficiently at that, that juncture point. I'd also remind all the audience that even as we get excited about the ADARA data for the benefit of osimertinib adjuvantly for EGFR activ uh, activating mutation uh, uh, tumors, we also always have to remember that for at least uh, tumors that are four centimeters or larger, overall survival benefit is still robust, modest, but robust for four cycles of adjuvant platinum-based chemotherapy. Well, thank you all. This was a great discussion. Our patient did really well uh, with her treatment. Uh, so let's move on to the next case, and I'll turn it over to Sandeep and Casey. Great. Casey, do you want to introduce our next case? Uh, thank you for that great first case. I'm going to be presenting the case of Edwin, um, uh, along with uh, Sandy. Edwin is a 54-year-old male with a new diagnosis of sarcomatoid non-small cell lung cancer metastatic to the bone. He is a former smoker. He quit his 30-pack year habit 15 years ago. He has a large pleural effusion that was recently drained and an IHC of the pleural fluid shows a PDL1 of 50%. Uh, NGS was also performed and no other uh, mutations were detected and so Edwin was started on pembrolizumab. Um, about three weeks after starting treatment, Edwin calls the clinic um, and he reports shortness of breath, cough, no fever chills, no chest pain. Um, we bring him in for a clinical uh, physical exam. His O2 SATs are 88%, is a low grade temp of 99, heart rate 118, um, and Bilaterally, we're hearing diffuse crackles. Um, it's a pretty um, urgent situation. So he's sent over to the hospital and ultimately admitted with uh, the following chest CT images as below. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Sandeep. And as Casey so nicely presented, um, the prior imaging to radiologists, there were uh, ground glass opacity changes, but there are also changes characteristic of organizing uh, pneumonia, which um, is of a concern in the context of immune pneumonitis, which should always be consideration uh, for a patient receiving cancer immunotherapy. However, these patients have a large differential diagnosis in terms of the cause of their dyspnea. It can include infectious pneumonia, COVID-19, tumor progression, prior radiation changes, pulmonary edema, perhaps from concomitant cardiac issues. Um, other immune-related adverse events, immune-related myocarditis can often have some of the symptoms of immune pneumonitis. Um, and so based on these imaging changes of organizing pneumonia and ground glass opacities, um, a, a negative procalcitonin, a, a normal EKG troponin, uh, the patient receives um, a four-week uh, course of prednisone uh, tapered starting from one milligram per kilogram uh, over four weeks. Um, the pembrolizumab um, uh, is, is discontinued. And, and the patient actually uh, has a really nice response to steroids. His dyspnea resolves uh, within 48 hours, and his O2 sats return to 98%. Uh, so a successful treatment of immune pneumonitis while ruling out the other causes. And so there are different grades for pneumonitis. Conceptually, uh, it's asymptomatic or symptomatic or highly symptomatic in the sense of needing hospitalization or ICU level. Um, broadly, um, these are also steroid responsive or non-steroid responsive. And for the patients in whom steroids do not improve uh, the pneumonitis situation, uh, the agents that remain um, typically have um, limited efficacy, uh, but these are drugs such as IVIG and fliximab or mycophenolate. 
So the most important thing we can do for these patients is to catch pneumonitis early, treat it aggressively with steroids, and try to avoid certain situations that create pneumonitis in the first place. For example, um, mistakenly treating someone with an EGFR inhibitor um, and uh, because we don't have the NGS back um, by giving immunotherapy um, as opposed to just waiting for the NGS results or just starting chemotherapy alone. And so the best treatment here is prevention. And so while the initial NGS was negative uh, based on the pleural effusion, which likely was acellular, and the remaining lesions were bone metastases, which are difficult to biopsy and often more difficult to get viable DNA from, uh, cell-free DNA on relapse was performed to assess for treatment options. Um, and, and this molecular testing actually showed an ALK fusion at this juncture. Um, the patient was started on electinib, uh, though brigatinib and even lorlatinib uh, remain reasonable options in the U.S. Um, in 2021 for the frontline therapy of uh, ALK rearranged on small cell lung cancer. And the patient had substantial tumor shrinkage, but started to develop elevated LFTs requiring dose interruption and a prednisone taper. And the, whether this was related directly to the elective itself, which can have hepatotoxicity independent of antecedent immunotherapy, or if this toxicity was potentiated by the prior use of pembrolizumab is unclear, uh, this patient received a course of prednisone just in case, and uh, their immune hepatitis resolved, and the patient was able to continue on electinib successfully uh, for years. And so it's key, um, if possible, to try to get the correct molecular diagnosis at the time um, of uh, initial diagnosis because that helps the patient get on the right track, but also avoids going on the wrong track that can potentiate toxicities in the future. This is more problematic for EGFR mutations. And so with that, i um, uh, happy to have my, my friend and colleague, Matt Gumans talk about non-small cell lung cancer and asymptomatic brain metastases. Thanks, Andy. I'd like to present the case of Mary. Mary is a 63-year-old Caucasian woman with a 50-pack year smoking history who quit smoking five years ago. She presented to urgent care with new onset shortness of breath that affected her exercise regimen over the last two weeks. Chest x-ray showed a large right pleural effusion and a right upper lobe two centimeter lesion. Chest CT done quickly thereafter showed this right lo upper lobe lesion and pleural effusion, as well as a right paratracheal lymph node that was enlarged. I'll hand it off to my interventional pulmonology colleagues. Talk to, I'd like to hear a little bit about your approach to uh, managing large symptomatic pleural effusions in cases like this. Thank you, Matt. Um, in patients with advanced cancer, metastases and malignant pleural effusions, especially when symptomatic, thoracentesis is our usual first intervention. It can be both diagnostic and therapeutic in these patients. And the tissue can also be uh, used for sequencing in some cases, although not all. So this cytology was shown to have lung adenocarcinoma that was TTF1 positive, indicative of lung origin. And so we know at least by involvement of the pleura, this is at least stage 4A disease. And notably, after thoracentesis, she returned to her robust baseline, no respiratory or CNS symptoms, and back to her normal exercise tolerance. She then proceeded to additional workup. FTG PET showed the right upper lobe tumor and the pleural deposits to be hypermetabolic, as was the mediastinal lymphadenopathy we had observed before, but there was also avid left adrenal metastasis and a T3 bony lesion. She also was staged with a brain MRI, and this showed three lesions, all of them under a centimeter in size and none of them with significant edema. This shows the three slides. Again, you can see that none of them are displacing other structures. None of them have significant edema. So we did send a cytology for evaluation. And before I talk about results, I wanted to ask Grace to comment on the adequacy of some of these cytology specimens from pleural fluid with respect to the initial diagnosis and to the IHC testing we do for PDL1 and for next generation sequencing or other molecular tests. So effusion specimens are actually really great specimens in trying to determine whether or not there is actually tumor present. We can use various immunostains to identify the type of tumor, such as things like TTOF1 to identify lung adenocarcinomas, or P40 to identify squamous cell carcinomas. And in addition, that material actually, because it's, um, it is actually very good for also identifying um, mutations as well. It can be sent if there is adequate material for cell block um, that we can actually send it for next generation sequencing. 
In addition, we can use that material for PDL1 staining. The limitation for doing PDL1 testing in an effusion is that we cannot identify what is truly a tumor infiltrating lymphocyte. Thanks for that clarification. So we did send the NGS and that returned with a KRAS G12C mutation. So now I, uh, we don't have any radiation oncologists with us today, unfortunately, but maybe I'll ask Sandeep, what's your approach? I think we have two big issues here. We have a patient with multifocal, though asymptomatic brain metastatic disease, but we also now have a clearly stage four systemically metastatic KRAS G12C adenocarcinoma. What's your approach here? Yeah, I think we, we don't have clear answers. And I think one step to take back is with the advent of KRAS G12C mutation specific inhibitors, I just want to be clear that those take a role really in second line therapy. We don't yet know uh, their role in the frontline space or in particular with CNS metastasis. Um, you know, typically in this scenario, if I know a patient has a KRAS, uh, whichever mutation, um, I'll typically refer them to our radiation oncology colleagues um, for discussion of SRS, uh, three lesions um, is usually amenable for uh, stereotactic approach, uh, which has superior efficacy and decreased toxicity compared to whole brain radiation. Um, and uh, we would, they would often get their SRS treatment um, and then move on into um, their systemic treatment. And so for a patient with a KRAS mutation stage four, um, I think there are multiple reasonable options. The pdl one score was high. One could use pembrolizumab by itself or atezolizumab or semiplumab. One could use chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab. One could use nivolumab plus ipilimumab um, or chemotherapy uh, plus nivolumab plus ipilimumab. Um, I, I think there are multiple reasonable options here. Um, in, in my clinic, if the patient is a chemotherapy candidate, um, I'd most likely lean for a chemo IO approach. Uh, and for patients with brain metastasis, I, I may consider chemotherapy plus ipilimumab plus nivolumab, uh, though chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab is a perfectly reasonable um, option here as well. I'd be curious to hear what would you do with this patient um, in your clinic, Matt? I agree. We have an embarrassment of options in, in 2021. We do here at our institution tend to use chemotherapy and immunotherapy combinations as well, though I think that in this case, cipolumumab and nivolumab is a perfectly reasonable approach. As you can see, we started her on carboplatin, pemetrexid, and pembrolizumab. I think another interesting side point here for our medical oncologist is kind of realizing which of our agents tend to have some CNS activity. Some of the next generation TKIs, especially in the EGFR and ALK space, have superlative CNS activity such that we often are willing to wait on the treatment of at least asymptomatic and small brain metastatic disease to see on early restaging if we can get an effect. In this case, I think this was actually more of a chronology issue. I generally would have agreed with you to treat with a stereotactic radiosurgery for this patient, but I think because of the way her uh, uh, presentation came about, she went ahead with systemic therapy, and it turned out that at four weeks, we did see resolution of one lesion and improvement of the other two. And that might speak to the fact that both pemetrexid and pembrolizumab independently at least have some CNS benefit. In my, in my book, not enough to rely on initial therapy for a lot of patients, but it's important to note that they do have some of that benefit. And then at eight weeks, when we restaged her with CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, there was marked improvement in all sites of disease. As you pointed out, and I appreciate that, that, that call out, the KRAS G12C, which represents a full 13% of our non-small cell lung cancer patients with non-squamous disease, which heretofore has been very difficult to target, there really are exciting emerging targets that are looking to be very promising, probably initially in the second line, but also in combination. So even though this wasn't per se an actionable mutation in the here and now, it's something that's going to to open up options for Mary in the, in the near future, either on clinical trial or potentially upon approval of some of these targeted agents. And so we've had three great cases that really run the gamut of uh, thoracic oncology from our esteemed faculty. And we've heard from expert pathologists, interventional pulmonologists, um, advanced um, nursing practitioners, medical oncologists. And, and we really just uh, are, are showing the, the part of the team, right? This, the team actually expands to include pharmacists, radiologists. Um, it really takes a village to take care of these patients, but the outcomes can really be improved dramatically. Um, if we look at the overall burden of cancer and, the can and cancer mortality in the United States, um, in the past five years, we've made more progress um, against cancer. We've actually bent the cancer curve for the first time ever in terms of survival 
that benefit has been driven by advances in thoracic oncology and a multidisciplinary approach, uh, very much as my colleagues um, here um, represent and manifest, um, is key in not only taking care of the patients diagnostically, but getting them through their therapy successfully because their outcomes are, are so much more improved uh, due to the advances that have been made in this um, field. And so with that, I, I'd like to maybe go around and, and just ask um, everyone on the panel, you know, what's one or two takeaways um, our, our listeners should uh, take away uh, from uh, the, the presentation? And maybe um, I'll start uh, with uh, uh, Grace Lynn. So from a pathology perspective, um, everything is very, very exciting. In terms of what we find ourselves doing is that we're trying to, we're being asked to do more and more, and sometimes with less and less tissue as we more, move more and more towards the cytology diagnosis. And so it's just something to keep in mind as we're trying to get um, next generation sequencing pdl one testing is that um, uh, adequacy is always gonna be a, a, one of our limitations. That's a great point. Um, and then uh, Matt Gubitz, you wanna uh, comment from a medical oncology perspective? Yeah, really to amplify Grace's point, it's so important to get the data, especially for our non squamous patients. You can't treat what you don't know. And so many of these advances really relate to the actionable mutations and fusions and alterations that we find in patients' tumors. I think it's so easy to um, fall prey to the logistical issues of getting adequate sample and getting the answer and relying on piecemeal approaches. But as the second case pointed out, here was a 50-year-old with a reasonable smoking history who had an actionable mutation that we demographically associate with non-smokers or light smokers. We can't be nihilistic about this. There are mutations and alterations in all of our patients ready to be found and to be treated with standard of care therapy or ultimately on clinical trials for future opportunities. Uh, that's a great point and it echoes true. Uh, you know, we don't treat um, a lung spot empirically with chemotherapy. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, we need a histologic diagnosis uh, in, in 2021 20, and beyond. A molecular diagnosis is, is just as important. Uh, Casey, what's your perspective in terms of these cases, but just broader uh, in, uh, importance in terms of the care of, of these patients with lung cancer? So I think from a, a nursing perspective and a, a nurse practitioner and, and PA perspective, um, you know, a lot of times we're the first point of contact for patients when, when they're calling the clinic. So it's important to recognize, uh, you know, signs and symptoms of, of, of uh, treatment related um, toxicities. Um, specifically in this case, it was, you know, pneumonitis, but as we know, immunotherapy and some of these targeted therapies uh, can can present in other ways, and it's important to uh, recognize those early and and get them in and get them treated um, quickly. Absolutely, and uh, you know, for our patients, the ability to to talk with people like Casey um, is life changing and and life preserving because it's able to get them safely through these therapies. They're broadly very safe, and, and our ability even with chemotherapy to deliver. Um, uh, to talk, uh, a benefit profile that's worthy of the toxicity, which we've improved upon over time, um, especially with targeted therapy and immunotherapy, uh, just heightens the importance of us uh, making sure that during the patient's journey, we're able to keep them safe and people like Casey um, are very much able to do that. Um, David, what are your thoughts um, in terms of these cases or just the broader landscape of thoracic oncology? I think the multidisciplinary team approach really emphasizes and highlights the value of obtaining complete and accurate information upfront in a rapid manner with minimal risk. And as the first case illustrates, in patients who have evidence of mediastinal lymph node involvement or hyalur lymph node involvement or a central tumor, the chance of mediastinal lymph node involvement is sufficiently high that the most effective and first step as recommended by guidelines is actually mediastinal lymph node sampling with bronchoscopy and endobronchial ultrasound. That step is frequently done incorrectly. In a, when you look at SEER Medicare data, only one third of patients get that as the first test. But if you do that first, bronchoscopy with EBUS sampling done systematically, you will get complete staging and you will be able to, to supply the necessary tissue for all subsequent uh, testing. 
if the EBUS is negative, you can biopsy the peripheral lesion at the same time and avoid other unnecessary risks. The second key point is in high risk patients, which we saw in the first case, where your pretest probability of mediastinal lymph node disease is high, then consider if your EBUS is negative, confirming that it's truly negative with mediastinoscopy in select cases. In this way, pulmonologists as part of the multidisciplinary team can set the stage for future success. Great points and uh, really emphasizes the multidisciplinary um, discussion that's needed in the care of these patients. And last but absolutely not least, uh, Moment, what are your thoughts um, in terms of the landscape in these cases? Well, I want to echo what uh, David was uh, highlighting. Uh, accurate staging of non-small cell lung cancer is crucial to obtain the best outcome for our patients. Um, when you see evidence of metastatic, metastatic disease in the mediastinum on CT or PET, we must sample those uh, mediastinal suspicious lesions to ensure that we have the right stage for our patients. The second point I would make is not every patient with lung cancer will get surgery or a large amount of tissue because many of them have advanced stages and we have to rely on cytology-based tests, whether it's done by the radiologist or the pulmonologist. So it's very important for the uh, proceduralists who are sampling uh, to um, be in a multidisciplinary discussion with the pathologist and ensure that they get adequate specimens and that these specimens are ha handled well and preserved well. And then in the pathology department also, um, they uh, you know, handle them uh, in, in a way that leaves enough tissue for uh, testing for driver mutations uh, in non-small cell lung cancer. Great points. And really just to echo my colleagues, uh, it, it takes a village to take care of these patients. Um, and it really takes a, a group of skilled multidisciplinary um, experts um, to help patients fight um, you know, what many of us think and truly believe is one of the hardest diseases uh, to fight. And so in addition to the patients, the caregivers, um, education um, with the caregivers um, to, to help the patients through their journey, um, I think is truly key. Um, but as you saw with all these cases, uh, it, it's not um, a monolith. There's a lot of complexity and there's a lot of dynamism. And, and having access to teams such as the esteemed faculty um, or your institution's um, version of our esteemed faculty, um, I think is key in helping to keep our uh, lung cancer patients safe. Um, as the outcomes have improved so substantially, I, I really do think the best is yet to come, though, for our patients um, with the continued efforts um, of the faculty, many of whom you've, you've heard of here today. And so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their time um, and like to thank the NCCN and the France Foundation uh, for um, this effort.